But this morning we're going to focus on the theme of hope again. And in that we recognize that Jesus is the hope of the nations. Amen? It's the hope for the people of Ukraine. It's the hope for the people of the United Kingdom. And actually we really delight that as we lift high the name of Jesus, that Jesus speaks to us. Uh, so let's sing Jesus, hope of the nations.
Spirit, we just desire you to fall in this place today. Lord, there's hunger, there's hope in your presence. There's freedom in your presence. And when we know the truth, the truth shall set us free. Spirit, fall in this place. We welcome you, Lord. Come, fill us afresh, Lord. Fill us afresh with your goodness and your love. Lord, thank you that all our lives you've been faithful to us. Because you're so, so good. Lord, we just desire nothing more than Moses cried out. Show us your glory today, Lord. Show us your glory in this place, Lord. Because when we, when we see the glory of God, we'll have no other desire but to fall face down in worship. Perhaps we just sing that chorus again, just where we just say, Spirit, fall. There's hunger, there's hope, because Jesus is here. He's here and he wants to touch our lives. So let's just sing that chorus. Just cry out to him. Even if it's through tears, cry out to him. He's near. Bible says to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The Bible says that even young men grow tired and weary, but to those who hope in the Lord, he shall renew their strength and they'll rise up on wings like eagles. Maybe you're, maybe you're tired this morning and Jesus just wants to restore you and renew your strength. Maybe for some of you, you just need to bring before him hurt and pain. And Jesus is saying, come to me with that pain. Cast all your anxiety upon me. I care for you. I love you. Just come before him. Just imagine, you might find that helpful to look at the cross on the wall here, or you might find that helpful just to think about some of the imagery of what we've sang about. Just bring it to Jesus because he cares for us and he loves us. That he loves you, his child, with an everlasting love. It's not wonderful to know. Maybe for some of you, you're fearful about your future. 
Remember that God's perfect love casts out all fear. All fear. I'm just going to be still in the presence of Jesus before I speak. So Lord, we, we do want to pray. Now as we come to the living word, I pray that Jesus Christ will speak powerfully. Because Lord, your word has power to touch us, to comfort us, to sustain us. So Lord Jesus, may I decrease and may Jesus increase, we pray. Lord, I recognize apart from you again, I can do nothing today. Just fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit, I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. That song, Spirit Fall, I think is a wonderful song. It's very simple. Uh, but I really believe when we sing that song, I honestly believe prophetically before God, that's what God wants to do in this church. He wants the Holy Spirit to fall in power. And he, he wants us to experience something of his glory. It's not amazing that we can join with God and we can share in those wonderful moments. I'm also to one thing that I've uh, learned very quickly as a, as a pastor, or even as a Christian, is that it's sometimes hard to follow Jesus, isn't it? It's always a delight, it's always a privilege, but it's hard sometimes. But Jesus really cares about you. He really does. He really does love you. And I'm going to be speaking this morning from the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. So if you've got your Bible, you can turn it on or you can, or you can uh, look up your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to read from verse 1. And this was written to a community of people who were, in one sense, facing uncertain times, a bit like Jeremiah the last week. They, they were displaced, they were scattered uh, because of uh, their commitment to Jesus Christ. Let's read what it says. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, and notice what he, how he describes their relationship to the world. Strangers in the world. Scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who's been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Isn't that beautiful? God wants to pour out his grace and peace to you in abundance. This is my favourite verse in all of Scripture. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are being shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now you, sorry, though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by far, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So Peter is writing to this group of believers are scattered all across uh, the Roman Empire because of their faith in Christ. They're, they're in one sense, it wasn't just that they were uh, isolated because of, uh, their, because of their faith, but they were becoming increasingly isolated because of their values. Their values were becoming increasingly hostile with the environment that they were living in. I wonder if that sounds familiar. 
in many parts of our world, following Jesus is costly. And can I tell you, there's people even in this building who have left lands where it's incredibly hostile and difficult. Dare I say, it might even mean, dare I say, a life sentence on some people's head for following the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter writes to remind them that actually they've been chosen by God. And actually, that, actually that, that's an amazing truth, not just for people who are, who are struggling, but it's actually it's an amazing truth for us just to even comprehend that. You know, I've been out of so many Bible college lectures where they go into the nature of predestination and try to be smart about it. And I just used to say, just think about it and just marvel at it. Even if you're not a Calvinist, it's a wonderful truth to know that we've been chosen in Christ. But actually, Peter writes to remind God's people, even when they're scattered, even when they're isolated, that they are a people of hope. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great, great mercy, he has given us new birth into a, what does it say? Living hope. Christians are called to be people who demonstrate the hope of the world, i.e. the Lord Jesus Christ. It was, it was Bill Hybels, who's an American leader, who said the local church is the hope of the world. And he used to scream when I read that, I read that quote, I said, you're wrong, Bill. Actually, Jesus Christ is the hope of the world, manifest through the local church. But I get what his sentiment was. But as Christians, we're called to be a people who demonstrate a living hope. See, when, when I, when I, whenever I read that before, you know, I... I I used to think about living hope, something which was alive, something which was dynamic, something which was real, something which was vibrant. But actually, the image of living hope in Greek is something which matures in time. Something which doesn't just start, the, start well, but continues to grow and continues to develop. But notice, why, why do we have hope? through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope is this, that Jesus is alive. Is that good news, friends? That actually Jesus is alive. You know, we're, we're not just called to dare say be an Easter people on Easter Sunday. When two weeks ago we would sing with full enthusiasm, he has risen, watch my voice, Gav, right? But actually in that, we're called to be a people who celebrate unashamedly that we are a resurrection people 365 days a year. We take the resurrected Christ with us, and that's what gives us hope. It gives us hope to face today. It gives us hope to face tomorrow because Jesus is alive and he is with us as we gather to worship. But that hope is also a future hope. It's not just something that sustains us in the present. I'll talk about that a wee bit more in a minute. But actually, we have a future hope in the Lord Jesus Christ that we're born again into a living hope through the resurrection, into an inheritance that will neither wrinkle, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Heaven is glorious, friends, isn't it? Actually, you know, I think you appreciate that more and more. I'm only 30, but I appreciate that more and more. The older I get, I appreciate the wonder of that more. And I might sound ironic saying that as a 38-year-old, but I say that as someone who has faced their mortality as a 38-year-old on more than one occasion. But I won't go into that. I know I wasn't being naughty, all right? But can I say to you, the hope of heaven is wonderful because we know that even when we die we're absent in the body but we are present with our lord amen and actually sometimes they say as christians we we can fear the process naturally of our death we can fear the process 
But can I say to you, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, your hope is this, that God who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Amen? And actually, that's wonderfully encouraging when you think about it in the context of what Peter is writing about. You're scattered, you're disillusioned, you're facing uncertain times. But remember, you're a people of hope because Jesus lives. But also, your hope is this, that God has started in you will finish his work in you. Amen? And can I say to you, as Christians, sometimes we go through really, really hard times. And it's really difficult. And sometimes there I say we face tri- trauma, and sometimes we face crisis in our life, and we're saying, why, 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 why? And sometimes, can I say to you, that is not wrong. But can I say to you, you know, when you get to heaven, I'm not trivializing it at all. Please hear this. I'm not. But you'll see, Jesus, I understand now, and it was worth it for following you. Please hear that. But you're saying, what if I am suffering? What if I am going through those times which is really difficult? The Bible says in this, you'll greatly rejoice, even though for now, for a little while, you may have to suffer griefs and all kinds of trials. Remember, Peter is writing to people who have probably arguably known people who have lost loved ones for the Lord Jesus Christ. And actually, he's writing to remind them, yes, they have suffered grief. Yes, they have suffered pain. But actually, can I say to you, there is lessons which we can learn through being faithful in adversity. Can I say to you, one of my friends said this when I was going through a really hard time, and it was exactly what I didn't want to hear, but actually I think he was right. Never waste a good crisis. Never waste a good crisis. Can I say to you, there is lessons that you will only learn in the frying pan of suffering. And can I say to you, none of your experiences in your life, especially the hard experiences, are not for a reason. Can I say to you, we've sang our own, all my life, God has been faithful. Now, do you believe that, friends? All your life, not just the good parts, you know, even the ugly parts, the parts which are difficult. Romans 8, 20, one of my favorite verses in Scripture, that God can work all things together for good, for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. See, Romans 8, 20 is really a fulfillment of what? Joshua, uh, sorry, the life of Joseph in Genesis 50. And he says, that, you know, you know what, he went through betrayal. He went through all times of adversity. What they meant for harm, God meant for good. Can I say to you, not all of our life's experiences are pleasant. Not all of them are God's plans for our lives. But can I say to you, God can use the ugliest parts in our life and the sorest parts in our life to bring Good. But sometimes we need to learn to persevere. You know, James 1 says this, perseverance must finish its course that you may be complete, lacking nothing. You know, we live in a generation, don't we? We want it and we want it fast. Can I say, sometimes we want deliverance from the trial. But can I say to you, sometimes in the, in the, in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the heartache, Actually, that's where God is teaching you the most. Can I say to you, never waste a trial. Always ask God, what are the lessons that he's trying to teach you in those moments? Because actually, can I say this to you? And this is going to tell you something. And if it hasn't happened now, it will happen you will suffer for following Jesus Christ. You will. 
you will go through heartache in life. I hate to tell you that. But I wouldn't be your pastor if I didn't. And maybe you're here just now and actually you're going through that heartache at the moment. And you're screaming, life's not fair. Where are you, God? Are you there? Can I say to you, uh, please hear this in the nicest way and shout amen if you agree. I hope we can, uh, we can shout out the songs of praise and we all say amen to that. But also, I hope that we can also shout a loud amen if I say, well, actually, we need to be there for one another when we're crying out the, God, the song, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, I remember one of the most powerful prayer means in my life was when one of my leaders in Westray, he said, I'm struggling. Can you pray for me? And I would to this guy, and I, I, even to this day, he's probably one of my spiritual heroes. This man struggling? Really? Look at him. He's one of the closest things I've ever seen to Jesus Christ. But actually, you know what? That day, my respect grew from him from here, top here, because he was real. So I'm going to ask you a question. How are you doing, friends? Is everything all you know, everything's great, everything's wonderful, or is life just there? I say at the moment, a bit of a trial, a bit difficult, a bit painful, dare I say. Or maybe, dare I say, being even more vulnerable, maybe some of you are going, actually, you know what, God, I, I don't even really know if I doubt, I'm doubting who you are. Or maybe, let's go one step far, maybe some of you are saying, actually, I don't even know if I believe anymore. Can I say to you, God is with us, not just in the, on the mountain tops, but God is with us in the moments of sorrow and pain. And God cares. Peter would say this: "They are for a little while." Let me read on this other verse in one Peter chapter five, just to bring this home to you verse 10 in chapter 5 and the god of all grace has called you to eternal glory in christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong firm and steadfast to him be the power forever and ever and we would all say amen you might be in the trial at the moment, but remember, God is in the midst of restoring our lives. Even the heartache of our life. And can I say to you as a pastor, and I mean this in all seriousness, what I'm going to say, you can say absolutely anything to me, and I won't judge you. I can assure you of that. All right? So if you are going through the times of the question, can I say to you, been there, done that, got that t-shirt. If you, need, if you are doubting, I've been there, I've done that, I've got that t-shirt. If you've had an argument with God, been there, done that, got that t-shirt too, all right? If you're crying out, why God, been there, done that, got that t-shirt, all right? So can I say, don't think of me on a spiritual pedestal, I'm not, all right? I'm dismantling these things, so I hope it makes it easier for you if you are going through adversity that you can talk to me, all right? But notice, though Peter writes to believers who are challenged and they're going through hard times, he said, these trials have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold may be refined by fire, may be proved genuine, and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Can I say to you, one of the verses, I'm sure that most of you have got this one uh, highlighted in your Bible, I'm sure, is this in Acts chapter 14. We must enter or endure, some our translations say, the kingdom of God by many hardships. Anyone got that one verse on their mind? It's a nice and cheery verse, isn't it? You know, that's one for the day. Excellent. You know, but can I say to you, sometimes we have this romantic ideal. 
hardship does prove our faith genuine. I remember, I'm not meaning this to isolate anyone here, all right? I want to stress this. I remember when I came here, before even I took the passion role, it was on my second Sunday here preaching. Andy spoke to me at the end of the service. So thank you, Andy, for this. You have no idea that you did this, right? And I talked a wee bit about, to the, at the vacancy committee, about just how Bucky was hard at times. I didn't go into many details, but Andy put his arm around me and he said, you know, Gavin, it'll be worth it. And Andy was right. It'll be worth it. And can I say to you, you might be going through the refining fire, but one day when Jesus Christ is revealed, it's not just what you say it is worth it because you'll see Jesus face to face. But can I say to you, in the light of your suffering in eternity, can I say to you this? In eternity, there's no more suffering. There's no more pain. There's no more sin. There's no more sorrow. There's no more sorrow. There's no more alienation. That's good news to people like Peter's writing to, isn't it? That's good news for us. And that's good news, dare I say, for the people of Ukraine today. And actually, one day God's going to say that he's going to make all things new. It's good news to the people of Iran that God is in control of the nation of Iran. It's good news to you. How's your week been? Good? Brutal? Someone's saying, yeah, I won't say who. All right. But remember, he's faithful. He's your rock in times of trouble. He lifts you up. Now, friends, let's just stop. Let's just be honest. I sense when I look her in the room that people are tired and they're weary and it's difficult. And that's not a criticism upon anyone. It's just being honest. What does Jesus say? Come to me, all oh, you are tired, weary, heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, on you, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is saying to you, his child, you might be feeling like you're going through the trial, but he's saying to you, come to me. Come to me. Come to me not when you're out the door, although God's with you when you go out the door. But come to me now. Come to me now, actually, even when you feel hopeless, remember that you're still a person of hope. Amen? Come to me. Come to me as you are. One of my favourite writers is a man called Max Lucado. don't know how many of you have heard of Max Lucado. Most of you probably have. I remember one day I picked up one of his books called Mocha with Max, which is a great title for a book, right? And he says this, tackle today's problems and today's strength and the strength which God provides. Can I say to you, when you look at your problem, it might look insurmountable and it might look like a massive mountain in front of you, and it probably is. But can I say to you, learn to tackle it one day at a time, one moment at a time, one hour at a time, and ask God for the strength that you need for each moment. Amen? So actually, friends, 
never waste a good crisis. To people who were scattered, they were people of hope because of their relationship with Jesus. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you are, are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. And I say to you, one of the things that most often goes when we go through adversity is our joy, doesn't it? Our joy saps within us. The book of Nehemiah has this wonderful verse that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And actually, my Bible and your Bible says that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Both Peter and Paul both write in the context of suffering. But there's hope in this passage because we are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. We don't see him now, but one day we will see him face to face. And we'll fall on our knees. And we'll say it's what he was worthy of it all. How are you? How's your week been? Good, bad, indifferent? I'll be honest and say my week's been pretty brutal. Alright? It's been a tough week. But I know this. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, God is good. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. We have got two songs to conclude. One which is a golden oldie, and one which isn't so much a golden oldie. One which reminds us, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, oh what a foretaste of glory divine. Where we declare, this is my story, this is my song, praising my saviour all the days long. And our one is reminder that God is the faithful one, the one who's a rock in times of trouble. And we're going to sing that song that we sang before I preached, where we're going to ask the Spirit of God to fall. Because there's hunger in his presence. There's healing in his presence, amen? There's freedom in his presence, amen? And in that we're going to cry, Spirit, fall.
Trouble. 